um, lecture two of reconstruction and complexity with the idea that maybe we'll only ever get to reconstruction, sorry. Um, okay, so let me just, just remind you briefly what we finished with last time. So at the very end, we talked about what I called V1, uh, holographic entanglement entropy, which is Ryutaki Nagi. So this is for space times that are when the bulk is static and to a leading order in G Newton, meaning exactly classical. The Neumann entropy is given by the area of the surface over four, right, the G in here, um, where R. The, this is the boundary region. This lies on a static slice. Meaning, this is the boundary. We're talking about a static slice. This is R. And XR is a surface. We call the radio talking surface or the RT surface, which satisfies the following properties. Um, it's locally minimal, and what we mean by that, it's locally minimal on a static slice. Meaning that if this is some static slice of a space time, and this is our surface XR, then within the static slice there is some normal to the surface. The variations of the incompressible area element of the surface with respect to this normal, this is zero. <coughs> Local minimum of the area is the first requirement. The second requirement is XR is homologous to R. And what we mean by that is that this, there's this HR here whose boundary is the union of R and XR. And finally, if there's more than one such surface, XR is the least area surface satisfying one and two. Okay, so this is the version of the proposal that we finished with last time. And there's a couple of comments. This matches very beautifully what we, the, the cases where we can actually compute this quantity. So in those cases, the, the answer we get from this matches it very well, including the divergences. You know, as we mentioned, there is a divergence in the phenomenon entropy that we can regulate with a UV cutoff, which matches an IR cutoff in the bulk, meaning at, la at large radius. Similarly, the divergence we get by going, having this one over G term here matches what we get by taking the large central charge limit. So uh, and in, but even the, the actual formula um, in cases where we can do the computation does match. So for example, in a 2D CFT, we can do the exact calculation, both in the pure ADS bulk, and we can also do it in the CFT, and we get the same answer, which is, which is really nice. OK, um, a couple of comments. This, as I mentioned last time, is not a vacuous requirement. You can have a situation where you have multiple locally minimal extremal surfaces, or minimal surfaces that are homologous to the same boundary region, and you'll have to pick which, whichever of them is have the least area of all of those that satisfy one and two. So we talked about um, complementary recovery. So that's this property that XR equals XR bar, meaning if this is the Ryutakianagi surface for the region R, it is also the Ryutakianagi surface for the region R bar. Um, it's pretty simple to see why this is true. Suppose that it were not the Ryutakianagi surface, then there would be a smaller area surface, whose, which is also anchored to R because R and R bar are complements, and then that new surface would have to be the one also computing the Bonneman entropy of R. So this is, this is what we call this complementary recovery for regions that will become clear later today, or tomorrow. OK, um, one, uh, one kind of fairly illuminating property of these, uh, of these surfaces, if the boundary regions nest, then so do the homology hypersurfaces. 
So we can uh, we can see this. The proof is kind is uh, I think somewhat illuminating. It's also the same technique that we use to prove strong subjectivity for these things. It's fairly simple. So suppose it were not the case. So this I here is our boundary. We're just drawing a single uh, moment of time slice going up. So R is going to be increasing in this direction. And we have some region here. We have a smaller region here. This would tell us that these should look like this. But suppose that they don't do that. Then instead we have something that And if they don't nest, then we have something that looks like this. This is R1, let's say, and one that looks like that. We can divide this up into separate regions. So we can call this, this piece over here, one, this piece over here, two, and this piece over here, three, this piece from here to here, four. Hope everyone can read this a little small, and this piece from here to here, six. And then we can just make a pretty clean geometric argument for why these things have to nest. So we say, all right, um, suppose this were not true, then, uh, then we have this configuration here. Now, if this is the rear Takenagi surface for R1, this is R2, then we know that this surface must be the smallest area surface that's going to be homologous to R1, local minimum, locally minimal. So then we say 1 plus 2 plus 3 meaning the area of part one and the area of part two and the area of part three, is going to have to be smaller than any other configuration, meaning smaller than one plus five plus three. This is by property, property three of the Ryutakinagi surface. And we can do make a similar argument for R2. Four plus five plus six is going to have to be less than four, four plus two plus six. And I really hope no one con ever quotes me on this out of context. <laughs> and so then we say, all right, well, this tells us from this first one here, we say 2 is less than 5. And from the second one here, we say 5 is less than 2. And so we find a contradiction. And therefore, the assumption is false. And indeed, these nest. So this is the basic uh, type of argument that we like to use for our Ryutakinagi surfaces. And a somewhat more sophisticated version of this gives you the fact that the Ryutakinagi area satisfies strong subjectivity, which is a very fundamental inequality about the Bonoma entropy. So, so, so what, what's area 4 and 6? What was that? So what are areas 4 and 6? So this is the, the, this is the area of 4, this is the area of 5, this is the area of 6. Yeah. I've just broken them up into pieces, but I could still compute the area. Other questions? So if you have, uh, if you have two segments, then uh, the minimal surfaces will undergo surface solution as a function of the distance between them, right? The, well, it, I mean, it also depends on the, the lines. it also depends on the on the bulk geometry between them. You could imagine having something, some very unusual bulk geometry right here, so it's not it's not totally straightforward. Question? Uh, what did you denote with capital H? Uh, was, it, was it the surface or? I, is it uh, capital uh, H R1? Is it the surface or? So capital H is this homology hypersurface. That's the region between them. Other questions? OK. Uh, one last comment on these, and then we'll move on to the version that doesn't have time dependence, that doesn't have time independence in it. Um, let's see. So the final comment I want to make is about uh, connectivity of this uh, of this surface H. So last time we talked briefly about the situation where we have multiple regions, multiple connected regions, R1 and R2. And so these have a couple of different possibilities for the real Takenagi surface. We have this one, and we have this one. And they're both homologous to the union of R1, of R1 and R2. So 
one, uh, one, one thing I mentioned last time is if, um, if we have a situation where the where H is disconnected, meaning we have two distinct components, so that's this situation over here, <coughs> then so if H R1 union R2 equals H R1 union H R2, then rho R1 union R2 approximately factorizes. And approximately here means to leading order in G Newton. Another way you can think about this is to say, okay, if we compute the Venomian entropy of rho R1 plus rho R2 minus the Venomian entropy of rho R1 union R2, then that's literally t asking, do we have this connected situation or do we have the disconnected situation? So if this is, um, is of order one over G Newton, then H R1 union R2 is connected. Now you may have heard the slogan, entanglement builds space time. And that's one of the original motivations for that. Because if we see that we have a large amount of entanglement <coughs> between R1 and R2, then we get a connected space time between them. So we, we, and H is connected. And we have to be careful here because this turned out to be manifestly false once we start adding quantum corrections. So this is true classically. As soon as you add quantum corrections, you can have a situation where this quantity is order one over G, but the space time between them, this, this, uh, this region H, is disconnected. So we have to be careful. I'll give you, a, if we get to it, I'll give an explicit example where that happens when we have quantum corrections. So that's right. So it's very surprising that this is possible. Um, it's, the same, it's the same type of phenomenon that allows us to have quantum extremal surfaces where there are no classical extremal surfaces, even though you'd think that they should always be some small perturbation away from one another. Yeah. Other questions? We'll get to quantum extremal surfaces shortly. Okay. What's the question? Sorry. Yeah. What is exactly static slides? A static slice, good. So a static slice here, so here we are assuming that our space time is static. And what we mean by that, like a little info box here. So when we say a space time is static, we mean that um, there exists a time-like killing vector field, TA. That's, so that's a statement that the space time is stationary. If the space time is static, then there exists and um, TA is hypersurface orthogonal, meaning that um, there exists a foliation of the space time by slices that are orthogonal to TA. And this is what we mean by static slices. So in period S, for example, this is a static slice, and this is not a static slice. Other questions? So uh, if yeah. you have some partial overlap between R2 and R1, are you explicitly constructing the So if you have partial overlap between R2 and R1, then of course it's not a clean situation like this where you can, there's gonna, well, you're, you're talking about partially the same region, so it's, gonna be, it's not going to be clean like that. They're always going to have a situation where the entanglement wedge is going to be larger um, and contain both of the of the individual entanglement wedges. Okay. All right. Um, had a couple of exercises here for those students who would like to try their hand at them. Um, so, practice. I'll just write this up here. So a very simple thing to do is to literally do this calculation for pure ADS3 CFT2 and find that it literally reproduces the phenomenon entropy of an interval of a CFT2. This is very simple. You essentially just take, you fix this R, you solve this, uh, you solve this equation, and you find that it's a geodesic, space like geodesic, compute its length, and you plug it in. And so show 
that RT equals 2D CFT entropy for pure ADS2, ADS3, CFT2. Um, another exercise that's related to this definition of what static is, uh, proof that if a surface lies on a static slice, and static slice, <coughs> uh, one of the properties of a static slice that you can show from this definition is that it satisfies this requirement. This is a part of the definition of a static slice, or it can be shown from the definition of a static slice. Then this condition is equivalent to this condition, where H is the induced metric on the surface. And I'll remind you, if this is the static slice and this is the surface, then we have a normal to the surface on the static slice. And we also have the normal to the static slice. And HAB is GAB minus NANB plus TATB, assuming T and N are both unit vectors. OK. Now, why do I bring up this very geometric statement here? Why is that useful? And the answer is that if you just look at this, so this is on XR, on XR. If you just look at the statement, you could say, well, Nowhere in this statement, if I just forget about where it came from, is there a reference to the static slice. This is a statement about properties of the surface XR without referring to the surface from which that it, that it lies on. And so if we're looking for a way to generalize Ryutaki and Agi away from this bit over here, which we want to do because static spacetimes are extremely non-generic. The vast majority of spacetimes are non-static. Static spacetimes are measure zero set. Then we might say, well, we want to find a way to take this definition of the RT surface and remove the static slice from it. And this here is another characterization that doesn't refer to the static slice. Of course, we got it from the static slice, but we can say, can we now forget about how we got it and just ask, what about just surfaces that satisfy this in general space times? And that is indeed one way to obtain the covariant time, inde time dependent uh, proposal for entanglement entropy. So for static slices, that's area. That's right. And we're going to see what, it, what it means for non static slices. slices. Yeah. It's minimal what? Well, we're going to see that in a minute. It's not the minimal anything, as it turns out. It's, uh, well, if you think of it's not, it's not minimal. Um, and we can already understand why it shouldn't be minimal just by remembering that what I just said, that this is computed by the length of the space length geodesic. Now, a space length geodesic is locally minimal on a slice, but you ask what happens, so you, 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 know, you wiggle it in the slice, its length is going to be increased by any wiggle. But if you wiggle it in time, then its length is going to be decreased. <coughs> so we know that actually it's not a local minimum in space time, it's a local minimum in space. It's a saddle point in space time. It's, it's a stationary point, yeah. That's right. So we're going to, so in a minute, we're going to use this definition, and we're going to write down something that looks like this, but it's going to be a stationary point, not a minimum. Uh, the well, in that expression, yeah. you don't, that's just the condition for stationary. Well, this is a condition, but NA is a distinguished vector, though. It's the one that lies on this very distinguished slice. This, it, it lies on this sta static slice. So we need to find a way of specifying what we mean, what vector goes in here, in, in the new definition that doesn't refer to static slices. And we'll do that in just, just a moment. Uh, NA, NA is the normal to the static slice? So NA here is the normal to the surface on the static slice. Yeah. OK. So. Um, a few comments on why, again, we want to move away from time independence to time dependent space times, mostly because the most interesting space times are time dependent. So, for example, the uh, Vaidya collapse. So, if you have thin shell collapse, this looks like this. This is, um, this is pure ADS here. This is ADS Schwarzschild over here. 
And this is time, very much time dependent. Now, you can take the shell to be thin. You can also take the shell to be thick, in which case you have more time dependence. You can have um, Oppenheimer Snyder, which is the case of a shell collapse. Sorry, that of, of a time like matter collapse. Again, this is very time dependent over here. Um, another example is a, an ADS cosmology. So if you embed OpenFRW universe in ADS, it looks something like this. <coughs> this is heavily time dependent. These are all very interesting space times, and we definitely want to be able to compute entropies for CFTs that describe these space times. And we want to be able to do reconstruction in these space times. So how are we going to do that? Well, the simple way we're going to do that is we're going to take this condition and we're going to say, forget about where it came from, let's just impose this condition. Got the empty boards left. static slice, it turns out that imposing this condition is equivalent to imposing the following. And this statement is true for all normals essay. So this is the statement that if you vary the area of this thing to leading order in that perturbation, this does not change. It doesn't tell you what the sign is second order. That would be telling you if it's a minimum or not. But it does tell you it's a stationary point. Now, the phrase people often use is extremality here. I don't love this because extremum to me means minimum or maximum. I prefer the word stationary. But this is the commonly used word these days, so we just kind of roll with it. So extremality. It's a saddle. I guess I, to me, I always think of extremum as a minimum or a, or, or a maximum. A, but there's more than one. Yeah, it, I, I, I agree with you. I'm just saying, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of preference. So I'm going to use extremality because it was commonly used in the literature. I think we, maybe we should have called it stationarity, but um, it's, it's a matter of personal preference. It could be extremely large and extremely small. Yes, this is, yes, the indeed. The extreme doesn't have a direction. It does not have a direction, yes. Um, OK, so this is, the state, this is essentially the equivalent definition of these two statements. Um, this is the surfaces whose area is stationary under all perturbations. And the perturbations in the location of the surface. Not so perturbations it, in the, the space-time. In the space-line, pure space-line direction. Uh, no, these are perturbations in all directions. Times. Yeah. But this, uh, in in space-like directions, it's... So it's a local it minimum in space and a local maximum in time. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you want to perturb it in a null direction, then you know that's a it's it's going to be it's going to be a local maximum in 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 a future null direction, a local minimum in a past null direction. Typically, if you have the null edge condition, yeah. Um, so in the static case, there are several optimal surfaces. So select the minimal one. Yeah. Yes. You're so what do we do right here? Good. Yeah. 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 Excellent question. So now that we've defined what we mean by an extremal surface, let's ask what is the actual proposal for the Bellman entropy. So. I'm going to use the fact that I have a version of this already up here. To substitute it with version 2, which is, so we got replaced <coughs> by Kubini and Rangamani Takenagi, so this is HRT from 07. <coughs> And this is not static anymore. We're not assuming that. We're allowing any space time here that we want. Um, but still, we're still in leading order in G. So we're not including quantum corrections yet. And we no longer need this to lie on the static slice. So it's still true 
that the Bonavent entropy is computed by the area of a surface over four in Planck units. And this surface is an extremal surface. Again, meaning this or this, whichever you prefer, they're equivalent. <coughs> Homologous to R. And if there's more than one surface satisfying one and two, it's the one with the least area. So we still take the minimum, but now it's over surfaces that are extremal. So, so this was proposed by Ahubini, Rangamani, and Takianagi. Um, there was a justification of Ryu Takianagi, the static case, by Lefkowitz and Moldesena. Um, that was a justification, not a proposal. It was a very important justification. Um, for the covariant version, the justification came from well, there are a couple of different ones. Uh, the most, the one that the, I think is, is clearest is um, Rangamani, Lefkowitz, and, and Shidong, I believe, um, who gave a Lefkowitz Baldesena style argument uh, that basically did um, Schwinger Keldish, did, yeah, they did the Schwinger Keldish version of Lefkowitz Baldesena. That's kind of how they got it to the, the time dependence in there. Yeah. But the proposal is due to these three folks. Other questions? Okay, let's talk about a couple of examples of this. This is the one you said is wrong. What is what? This is the one you said is wrong. What I said is wrong? V2. Oh, V2. This is, uh, well, this is wrong. This, no, this, this, is, this is correct uh, to leading order in G. Yeah. yeah but wrong there. Yeah, yeah we'll, 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 we'll have to modify it soon. Yeah. This is not the, the most recent version. Okay, a couple of examples. So in the uh, variety of space time, we could ask, what is the um, what is the HRT surface of the entire boundary, let's say? So S of rho entire boundary. This is zero. We can form this from a pure state. We do form this from a pure state. And the HRT surface. is the empty set in this space time. Now what's interesting is if you take the Ryuchakianagi surfaces of subregions, then in fact you can actually get behind the black hole horizon at early times. And this is not surprising because this is just pure ADS. So you can get behind the horizon because the geometry of this is pure ADS even though there's a horizon there. And so if you take, uh, if you consider you know, th this is really a circle, if you consider subregions here, then you can probe behind the horizon. This was first shown by um, Hong Lu and Josephine Su, and then there were a number of follow-ups on that. So this is our first example of a situation where we're computing something in ADS-CFT that's actually probing the black hole interior. It's not probing the old black hole, but it's still probing behind the event horizon. Now, another example where we can also probe behind the black hole horizon is um, perturbed Schwarzschild. So, this is a construction by uh, Schenker and Stanford, where you start out with ordinary Schwarzschild and you throw in shocks. And what shocks will do is they'll move the horizon out. But if you throw something into a black hole, as long as the energy is positive, then it's going to make the black hole grow. And so the horizons move outwards, and the <coughs> extremal surface that computes the benevolent entropy of either side lies behind the horizon. So this is for perturbed Schwarzschild, and because this is time dependent, we have to use this proposal to compute it. Another very simple example is just a non-static slice of pure ADS. So if you take some funny slice of pure ADS, then you're going to have to use um, this proposal because it's not going to lie on a static slice of the board. So needless to say, this is incredibly useful, and it gives us a lot of intuition and insight into space-time geometry. And in fact, it gives us the first, uh, first chance to define the entanglement wedge. I actually haven't defined it yet. We've just talked about Bonemann entropies and our aspiration to talk about the reconstructable region. 
So let's talk about the so entanglement what, what question. What is the status of this proposal? How do we know the true? Where, where can we check it against some other calculation that shows it? Well, so as I said before, there's a justification from the path integral by Lotkowitz and Maldusena. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, if you agree with the idea that the partition function can be approximated using the Euclidean path integral when you have an emergent space time by geometry, then you can just um, take that. You can also, there, there are also various checks we can do, like we can compute the 2D CFT, we can compute the Bonhomme entropy exactly using CFT techniques, and we can check it and see that this computes the same thing. So uh, I would say it's a it's fairly well established proposal. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, this, sorry, the, the Pyrenees example, or sorry, the Vaidya example? Yeah. Uh, what was the question? How do you get the empty set here? Well, um, this is so. This space time is topologically, any slice here is topologically trivial in the sense that um, there's no second boundary here. So if you ask, is the is the empty set homologous to the entire boundary here? And the answer is yes. Oh, is this is two dimensional. N not necessarily higher dimensional. So in higher dimensions, a slice of the bulk just looks like that. That means that if you ask, is the empty set homologous? In other words, is it true that there is a surface H <laughs> whose boundary is the union of the empty set with the region R, which is a full Cauchy slice of the, of the boundary? And of course, the empty set, is, this is just R. And the answer is yes. It's just a complete slice of the space time. Yeah. yeah. If I take several slices which end in the same region, would I get the same answer? Several slices that correspond to the same region. What do you mean? Well, because some boundary region. Mm -hmm. Different slices, though, this this makes no reference to a slice. So, if, if you're referring to the homology constraint, it's just that there exists a slice that does this. You don't care which. I mean, sure, you can wiggle the slice as much as you want. Because you in the static case, one was in the static case, very important. Was doing on the That's right. The very, the static case was very important that there's a slice that we're okay. doing this on. And this we freed ourselves of that here. Yeah. It's not clear what what feature of the new definition this example uses because even the previous definition. Um, no, it wouldn't because there's no static slice. Oh, so this this uh, the, the whole other boundary has been chosen. <coughs> well, there's no static. No, there's no there's no this space time is not static. So there is no static slices at all. The the previous definition, the Ryutaki Nagi, does not apply. Yeah, it's ill-defined here. Is it homologous proposal for large areas left? Is what? Is homologous work that you just referred? Is that for large left? It's the integer probing of the black hole. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, that's Hong, Hong Lu, so um Lu and uh, where yeah, where they looked at, at subregions and saw that basically you had these uh, surfaces that you know anchored here and were kind of doing this. Yeah. There's a nice plot in their paper where they basically track how far up they can go. Okay. So um, let's uh, let's start getting into the reconstructable region now. So in situation when there is a static slice, one was just cal doing calculation of static slice, mm -hmm. but could it be that if one applies this more general procedure, that one will get a uh, surface not which doesn't lie on the st static slice, slice, but would be. Right, you, you're worried. Does this reduce to we're talking like in the appropriate limit? Yes, it does. Right, it does. So if there is a static slice, it's guaranteed that w that will give the mean. That, that's correct. And uh, this is something called. Um, it's, it's part of, of this property here, mm -hmm. of the static slice. It's, uh, the static slice is called. Um, to it's the, something called totally geodesic, uh, which essentially is a property of the geometry that, that if an extremal surface starts on that slice, it's always going to stay on that slice. So if you have a a, a region R, this is the the slice that satisfies this. You have a region R here, and it lies on this slice. Then any extremal surface that you any any surface that solves the extremality equation that starts out on this slice has to stay on that slice. So that's something you can prove from this equation. Talk about the entanglement wedge. Okay, 
so we have some what looks to be a complete proposal at a classical level for the von Neumann entropy. And remember, we started looking at the von Neumann entropy because we were interested in understanding what the reconstructable region is, and that's something that we should be able to reconstruct. Uh, the von Neumann entropy, if we can compute it in the boundary and we have a duality, we should be able to compute it in the bulk. So let's now ask. So we say, all right, we should, so hypothesis, natural hypothesis at this point is to say that we should be able to reconstruct up to the HRT surface. X HRT. Now, really what we mean by that is we should be able to reconstruct all of H. And because we have this theorem by von Schoen and Bohr, that means we should be able to reconstruct the domain of dependence of H. So, or all of H. Now, I should say there is an assumption that goes into this, which is that there are no holes along the way. But that's a hypothesis. Let's say maybe we roll with that. Maybe we keep in mind that there's a hypothesis and we've assumed that it's not that we can reconstruct XR, but not everything between XR and the region. So this is a hypothesis. So we should be able to reconstruct up to XHRT or all of HR, which means that we should be able to reconstruct D of HR. And this object is what we define as the entanglement wedge of options and definition. Now, you could ask, can we reconstruct more? Should we be able to reconstruct more than that? And we can we already we've already seen the reason, an obvious reason, why the answer should be no. Do I do this thing where I call on someone? <laughs> no. Um, complementary recovery tells us this. So if R can reconstruct everything up to XR, and R bar can reconstruct everything up to XR bar, draw a picture. So if R can reconstruct everything in here, and our bar can reconstruct everything in here, then if we allow, we say you can reconstruct more, then we find that R and our bar, R can reconstruct part of something about our bar. But of course, by definition, by defining row R, we've traced out our bar. And so it should not be possible to reconstruct more. And this is what led to the proposal, so this hypothesis by um, Mark Van Ramstrong et al. and also Aaron Wall. And it's kind of directed it in sort of different ways that um, we should be able to reconstruct <coughs> the entire entanglement wedge and no further. But the entanglement wedge should be what's dual to everything in, the, in D of R, row of R and the operator content. Now, a couple of properties that make this <coughs> likely and, and sort of appealing and not too, um, too difficult to believe. of the entanglement wedge. So the first one goes back to a complaint we had early on, which, if you recall, the reason we dismissed the causal wedge as the possibility for being the dual was that we could modify everything in the causal wedge using local unitaries. And so we definitely always wanted to be the case that the causal wedge is in the interior of the entanglement wedge and not ever have a situation where the entanglement wedge lies inside of the causal wedge. And so you can indeed prove something called causal wedge inclusion. So 
this was proved by Aaron Wall in 2012. Assuming, if you assume the null energy condition, which is the statement that TAB in the null direction is greater than or equal to zero, which is something that we expect to be true of classical matter, you can actually prove it in supergra chapter supergravity. Um, if you assume this, then you can show that the causal wedge is a subset of the entanglement wedge. So we're good. That, that complaint we had earlier, we, we know that this, the causal wedge, the entanglement wedge does not suffer <coughs> from it. Second, another thing we can show, because we have complementary recovery, then it is the case that S of rho r equals S of rho r bar. This is always true when, whenever we have a pure state in the CFT, the phenomenon entropy of O r is the phenomenon entropy of rho r bar. So again, this is another check mark, a sanity check. Also, we want it to be the case that if we can, if we have rho r, we have two regions, r1 and r2, and r1 lies in r2, then all the information in r1 is contained in r2. So their entanglement wedges should be nested as well. And indeed, again, you can prove this also by Aaron Wall in this tour de force paper in 2012. This lies in that. And finally, these also satisfy strong subjectivity, also proved by Aaron Wall in this 2012 paper. Now, I should make one comment about this 2012 paper. It actually is a paper where um, Aaron just reformulated HRT in very different language. And um, I suppose I'm teaching the tutorial tonight. And if that's the case, then I'll be going over that different re that reformulation of, uh, of HRT called Maximin. It's very useful for proving things. It's less useful for computing things. So these are complementary uh, proposals. They're equivalent. But one language is more useful than the other. Any questions? You want to go through the steps of which one of these? Oh, so they can they can coincide. Um, this is very highly non-generic for the causal and entanglement wedges to coincide. Um, it's okay if they coincide because the, then the HRT surface lies just at the edge, and you can't act with a unitary in the interior to affect it. So it's, it's a sort of borderline case. Um, in pure ADS, this is exactly what happens. But as soon as you slightly perturb it, then you'll get this is a proper subset. Generically, it's a proper subset. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I won't go over any of these proofs, but um, I'll go over the, some of the technology uh, later today. I'll go over some of the technology that goes into proving these very elegant, um, but it's sort of a, a tangent right now. Okay, so before we actually talk about reconstruction and how to make sense of it, we're going to have to talk about quantum corrections. And part of the reason for that is when we say reconstruction, we, we mean something like, okay, you know, we're gonna turn on some operator and then we're going to want to ask, what is the expectation value of that operator in terms of the dual CFT? But to do something like that, we need to work beyond leading order in G Newton. Now, you might say, OK, but this is, uh, this is a perturbative expansion. So I think it's really going to change when we, you know, it's really important to include perturbative corrections. I mean, that's a, it's a cute story to keep us busy for a while, but is it really fundamentally different? Conceptually, is there something different here? And, uh, and the answer turns out to be yes. We can sort of already see this at the level of black hole thermodynamics. When we just talk about black hole thermodynamics purely classically, then you say, OK, you know, black holes have been sized by an area theorem, and the area increases, and we have the laws of black hole mechanics. But they can only be analogies. And of course, the reason they can only be analogies is that classically, black holes don't have microstates. They, uh, they are perfect absorbers. So they can't have a temperature because they can't radiate. And so classically, this is just an analogy. It took the inclusion of quantum corrections to understand conceptually that these are literally thermal objects. And so it, it is really actually significant and important to include quantum corrections. And as we'll see, it gives us things that are actually dramatically different, even though we're still working in the perturbative regime. Now, one way to <coughs> see, I guess, in the, in the case of, if you want to sort of something a little more concrete, in the case of a black hole of equilibrium, the area of the black hole, you can think of it as a, um, 
as a fine grained entropy of some thermal state. But then you say, all right, so classically, at black hole's equilibrium, it's exactly Schwarzschild, let's say. The area of the event horizon doesn't change. Two leading order in Newton. But as soon as we start adding quantum corrections, we have to start worrying about subleading orders because it's exactly zero at leading order. And so the quantum corrections, you could say, oh, maybe they'll cause a decrease in the area, and then that's a problem for thermodynamics. We have to make sure it causes an increase in the area. Either way, we have to figure out how to account for these. So it, all of this tells us there's a lot of information and including quantum corrections. This is just kind of a, a motivational spiel for why it's important for us to actually do so. Okay, so how do we add quantum corrections? How do I define the entanglement wedge? No, no, we mean this? Have you, have you defined this yet? Yeah, so th this is the entanglement wedge. Is it the main of dependence of the surface HR? And, and HR, HR is what? Some other <coughs> so HR is the homology hypersurface of your extremal surface. The extremal surface is homologous, that means there's a surface HR, and we take the domain of dependence. Now, if you'll recall, <coughs> the domain of dependence, once you've defined it, there are many different surfaces that will give you the same domain of dependence. So HR, which HR you pick is not important, just as long as it satisfies the homology condition. And the, H, and the HR is found in, in similar way as we, as we find the HRT surface. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. it's exactly, it's, it's, it's yes. homologous, same definition as for the RT surface, yeah. Other questions? The fact that you can uh, reconstruct things behind the horizon, isn't it kind of weird when it comes to clash with firewall and things like that? Firewalls are a problem for quantum corrections. No firewalls here, this is classical black holes. So this is going to change while we, when we add quantum corrections, we'll not be able to recover things behind well, the horizon? I mean, this is a fast collapse, so it's not a typical state anyway, so there's nothing telling us that even once we add quantum corrections, you know, this is a hard-harking state, doesn't mean that we have to have uh, a firewall here. Mm -hmm. So um, <coughs> as long as we're not working with typical states, mm -hmm. then we don't have to worry about firewalls either. Mm -hmm. At some point, you might want to talk about firewalls and the entanglement wedge of the CFT when there is a firewall. Um, we, we, we will talk about that. It's subtle, because we, we have to start worrying about what we mean by reconstruction and mm -hmm. when is reconstruction state dependent versus state independent. We'll, we'll get to all that probably, next, yeah, probably tomorrow. Before we get into all that, we do have to talk about how to incorporate quantum corrections in the first place. Okay. So, how do we incorporate quantum corrections in black hole thermodynamics? Remember, our V0 of all this was Bekenstein Hawking, so let's sort of go back to our origins and ask how do we do this in that case? Well, for Bekenstein, the important motivational principle was that the thermodynamic entropy of the universe should be going up. Not necessarily that the thermodynamic entropy of the black hole needs to be going up, but the thermodynamic entropy of the universe has to go up. What does that tell us? It tells us that what we really want is the sum over constituents of the universe. This entropy should be the one that is increasing or not decreasing as a function of time. This is for Bekenstein. So in other words, the entropy of the black hole plus the entropy of matter outside of it, this is the, uh, the actually relevant quantity. That's the quantity that we're actually interesting, interested in having as a non-decreasing function. And so Bekenstein defined something that he called the generalized entropy, which embodies this. So the generalized entropy of a surface, a again, a, two a d minus two dimensional or co-dimension two surface. So this is the area of the surface over four, I'm gonna just start working in units where g is equal to one, plus the von Neumann entropy of, qu of the quantum fields outside of the surface. So draw a picture. So we have some slice of the space-time. This is our surface, sigma. And this is the quantum state of the fields outside of sigma. So basically, we've traced out over the interior of sigma, and now we're looking at this. So here, sigma divides the space-time, the spatial slices into two, an interior and an exterior. Bekenstein was particularly concerned with cuts of the event horizon of a black hole. And this works whether you have an EDS black hole, or he was really thinking about asymptotically flat black holes, 
doesn't matter, we can define it either way. So here we have some, this is a cut of the event horizon, slice of it, and this is row out of set. So this is the context in which Bekenstein was interested in, um, in this generalized entropy quantity. Now, uh, just on the, uh, on the side on this A here, once you start adding uh, quantum corrections, then uh, what happens is you, you sort of, typically you're not working anymore with the Einstein-Hilbert action. You're sort of also adding some small higher derivative corrections. Um, maybe you're renormalizing Newton's constant. There are various subtleties that come into this. And so um, instead of computing an area here, we typically compute something called a generalized area. So you might see this term HN, which is also called S graph sometimes. So this was, uh, this was computed by uh, Bob Wald for, sta for, for stationary horizons. And then it was generalized by Shidong for non-stationary, non-killing horizons. It's somewhat complicated quantity. I'm just going to schematically write it as it's something like this. This is very schematic. It's not be an equal sign, kind of a approximately here. Um, let's see. There's some number here, and then you differentiate your Lagrangian, your modified Lagrangian with various high derivative corrections uh, with, with respect to the Riemann tensor. And then you differentiate the second derivative twice. And you also include here terms that go as the square of the extrinsic curvature of the surface. So, yeah. Sorry? D L squared is D squared. Right. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so this is a, a somewhat more complicated functional. Um, yeah, yeah, and then, yeah, exactly. It's, it's the uh, it's Einstein Hilbert action plus F of Riemann. Yeah. Um, high derivative corrections. Now, typically, so for, for, for now, we're, we're typically interested in high derivative corrections as we incur them due to quantum corrections, although you can be interested in them for other reasons. Um, for now, I'm just going to say that we're interested in them as they come up for higher derivative corrections, for, as, as, they, for, as they come up for quantum corrections. I'm going to typically just, uh, just work with this area term over here with the understanding that sometimes we might actually, it might be a, a little bit important to keep track of these higher derivative terms. Yeah, I've, I've, I've started setting g to 1, but yeah, we can put a g there. Yeah, yeah, I, th this is true. I, sh I should wait to set g to 1 until we've included all the corrections, yeah. Uh, could you just say again what, the, what uh, g long did? Uh, so this is, I mean, I, I have it written down here, but I'm not a fan of writing out this entire thing on the board. No, I'm not, I just, uh, conceptual wall I both discussed for general Lagrangian. Right, so, so the difference between the Dong entropy and the Wald entropy has to do with the extrinsic curvature terms. Um, so the, the, the Wald entropy is for killing horizons. So you don't have to, to deal with the extrinsic curvature of the slices. Whereas uh, Shidong generalized it to non-stationary, non-killing horizons, and there had to be terms that uh, depend on this. No, so we can define this for an arbitrary surface. <laughs> an arbitrary, sorry, an arbitrary surface that divides a Cauchy slice into. But at the same time, inside sigma, it is normal. There is also matter, and the the, the real matter, the real uh, entropy, is the sum of the entropy of the matter inside and outside. Uh, no, because we here we, so. So this is just, this is a definition. We can define the generalized entropy, we can just define it like this. You can then ask what is the meaning of this object, which is a different question. Now the meaning of the object, in the case when sigma is the event horizon of a black hole, then we say that this object computes the entropy of the universe because the area of sigma, or the generalized area of sigma, computes <coughs> the entropy of the black hole. Now, um, we're going to want to take this generalized entropy and apply it to surfaces that are not event horizons, actually. And that's what we're going to do in, in a minute. One more. Uh, and by matter outside, you also mean gravitons. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. If we only knew how to compute the phenomenon of gravitons, which we don't right now, but you know. Okay. Right. So matter, gravity, you're not. Matter. Yeah, I should say maybe um, everything outside. 
other question. Yes. Uh, <coughs> in, in this game now, uh, there is a, I, I have to, we assume there is a unique scale in the problem, which is L Planck and no other physics on top yeah, of it? Th this is a, an excellent question, um, which actually leads me to uh, a segue of something I was going to say in a minute, but I'll say it now. So if you look at this, you could say this is a very badly behaved quantity. There's a divergence here, and we also know that this is divergent. So this is, th this is a, a pretty bad situation, um, which is maybe what you're referring to here. Okay. Um, and so you could ask, how do we make sense of this quantity? Well, there's something, I'm not, I'm not someone who uses the word miracle lightly, but um, there's a bit of a miracle that happens here, which is that we, when you compute the, um, the divergences of this, they, are they typically go as, uh, as sort of integrals of geometric quantities. And it turns out that you can show for, a sc for scalar fields, um, both minimally coupled and conformally coupled scalars, and for, um, for vector fields, for uh, spin one half, spin three halves, you compute these divergences, and they exactly match the divergences that, we, that result from renormalizing Newton's constant from having these quantum corrections. So they cancel each other out exactly, which has led many people to propose that this quantity is actually uv finite. What does that mean? Where was the question? Yeah. What, what do you mean by renormalizing Newton's constant? So, so what happens here, so you get, essentially what you get, you get radiative corrections here. Um, and you can count them, because they, they look like an area over 4G, so you kind of count them as part of that. You can count it as a change in the area, or you can count it as a change in G Newton. But essentially, it's a term that, um, that <coughs> you, you, start, you have to, you start sort of balancing out divergences between this and that. That's, it's, I don't really want to get into the technical details of how this calculation is done, but um, the, essentially, the, um, there's good evidence, I'll just put it that way, that divergences here cancel out divergences there. And I, I would, I don't really want to get into the details right now, but if you want to talk afterwards, I'm happy to talk about it. From a more modern perspective on this, what is what? That's right. So the so next thing I was going to say is, you know, there's this, you know, type, this idea that, you know, when you're talking about um, this joint quantity, you're really going from talking about a type 3 one-dimensional algebra for the bulk quantum fields to so type 2. And, you know, that, that basically things are finite or vacuum subtracted, they'll be finite. Um, differences of traces are finite. And so th th it's a hypothesis, and the reason it's a hypothesis and not a proof is, well, one of the reasons is that we don't know how to compute this for gravitons or spin two, uh, so we, don't, we can't be sure that all the divergences always work out, but there's good evidence in favor of that. So it's a hypothesis that this quantity, the S gen is UV finite. Meaning this quantity is better defined than either one of its so um, constituents. So does it look like it also the boundary conformal field theory? We haven't said anything about the boundary conformal field theory, so I'm going to ask you to hold that question for a minute. Okay. The what's the inverse of this spectral inside and outside inside the signal in this formula? Sorry, I'm not trying to understand the question. So far, it's just the definition. It's just the definition. We're just, we're just. I haven't interpreted any of this in the context of ADS-CFT. I'm about to get there. So I'm sorry. So, so uh, you explained that there is a chance that, that this is a well defined That's the right. Belgian quantity, but still remains the question: why this is the right quantity for uh, consistent quantum gravity? Uh, absolutely, it's a good question. Um, one question, one, one, so there are a couple of different answers to that. There's the answer before uh, AD, pre ADS CFT answer. And the pre ADS CFT or the non ADS CFT answer is that this quantity appears to be increasing along event horizons of stable black holes. So it appears to be a good thermodynamic quantity. It also appears to, so, so, yeah, so this is the first, the first answer to your question in the sense of why is it that we might want to replace the, um, the entropy of a black hole, the, the area of a black hole with this quantity here. Now, the, 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 another answer to your question requires us to first ask, what is, where do we want to use this? I mean, we can't say, okay, we, this is the relevant quantity in quantum gravity, well, the relevant quantity for what? So I, I, the, the theme with all these questions I'm getting right now is I need to move it and get to the point where I tell you what we're going to use this for. So I'm going to pause on the questions and, uh, and actually tell you what this is used for. Okay, so. <coughs> This tells us there's a very natural, very natural quantum generalization 
the HRT. Version 3. Faulkner, Lefkowitz, Moldesina. And essentially, well, they did a lot more than that, but we are going to present it. It's, uh, it's going to sound almost trivial, which is not really fair to them, which is that you take HRT and you say, well, for, for a black hole, for a Bekenstein case, we replaced area with generalized entropy. So why don't we just do that? This is, uh, this is Faulkner Lefkowitz Moldesena, and I'll explain why you know, this is a seminal piece of work rather than just a trivial replacement. So, um, so their statement is that when you ask, so this is um, leading, so this is first order correction. So first subleading correction. XR is again the extremal surface as before. So the reason that this is a, a, a really, really important paper, and it wasn't just always oh, just a trivial replacement like Bekenstein had already told us to do, is that they also justified this from the path integral. So it's like uh, it's like Lefkowitz Moldesena, where they did the path integral derivation of Ryutaki and Agi, but here they carried it out to, for, to include the first subleading correction in G, and indeed they found that the phenomenon entropy of rho R is given by the generalized entropy of this extremal surface X. So this is this tells us if we're willing to accept the path integral as a you know, justification, then this is the correct way to compute von Neumann entropies once we're starting to add quantum corrections. Just using replicas. Just using that's using replicas. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, so this was it was a variation on uh, on Lefkowitz Moldesena. It just kept track of more terms, which is very complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Now. You could say, okay, uh, why am I insisting on this? Why, what, why is this, what, what goes wrong once we start adding higher order corrections in one of G, uh, in G? So, to begin with, they only argued this, they only showed it, or I don't want to use the word proved in ads but you know, they only uh, gave an argument for this to first subleading order, first subleading correction in G. But you can also ask, what goes wrong if you just say, maybe it's true in general? And, uh, and in fact, historically, this is how uh, Aaron and I arrived at version four of this. We basically said, is this going to be true in general or not? Well, we were actually, let's see, want to do this. Um, okay. Well, we had a number of concerns with this formula as stated. Uh, once we start including corrections, second order corrections. Now why, why second order corrections? Because second order corrections are the point at which you have to start worrying about back reaction of the quantum fields on the metric. So at this order, you just include the quantum fields in your calculations, but you don't worry about the back reaction. At second order, you have to start worrying about the back reaction. Now, Aaron and I had serious concerns about this formula at that order, but we actually did not have serious concerns about this formula for the event horizon at that order. And so, let me ask, why is it Sorry, that we will- Second order. Second order. Yeah. By that order. By that I mean second order, at the order of a back reaction. We were not concerned about Bekenstein's formula for the event horizon, but we were concerned about faulkner lefkowitz moldesena for the extremal surface. Now why is it that we were worried about this and not worried about that? And the answer is that we don't define <coughs> the event horizon as a geometric quantity using the generalized entropy. The event horizon is defined independently of this quantity. The extremal surface, this thing is defined using the area, right? This is the functional derivative of the area. But we're not computing an area here. We're computing a generalized entropy. The event horizon isn't defined using area, it's not defined using generalized entropy, it's defined using causal structure doesn't depend on that. Here, this is something very unnatural going on here. We're computing, first we take a surface, we say we're going to find the surface, which is the local minimum, or local extremum of the area, but then we're going to compute its generalized entropy. 
there's a very strange asymmetry here. And it leads to potential problems. So for example, if I like erase. Yeah, exactly. Th th thank you. Yeah, the, the, the surface is determined classically, but we're computing something quantum about it, which is already a bit of a red flag. Now, these properties, which I may have erased, um, so there were several important properties. Uh, I'm sorry, but in, in the event horizon case, it was only one static suit, including back reaction. Event horizon will disappear, so the whole may uh, evaporate. The event horizon will not disappear if you include perturbative back reaction. So the event horizon, so we include back reaction, sure, the event horizon can change. But the point is that the event horizon is not defined using the generalized entropy, not defined using local quantities in any way. The event horizon is defined, we, we computed the area of the event horizon before, and we didn't use the area to define it. So it's a, it's a quantity that exists independently of what we're using to compute it. Here, this quantity depends on the thing that we're using to compute. So it's, it's, a, bit, it's a bit unnatural. But there's a more, more significant problem here. So the if you recall, one of the most important things that we considered in building in the, the entanglement wedge was causal wedge inclusion. So causal wedge inclusion, again, was a statement that WC of R lies instead WE of R, and it assumes the null energy condition. This is violated by quantum fields. And in particular, what that means is if you take a black hole, you can throw in matter that has negative energy, negative TKK. The effect of <coughs> throwing in matter that has negative TKK is that it shrinks the black hole. So it moves the black hole, it is the event horizon inwards. Now, if we're in this generic, in this non-generic situation, where the event horizon and the, where the, um, the entanglement wedge and the causal wedge coincide, for example, <coughs> if we are in static black hole. I don't care what's behind the horizon, just outside it looks static. Now, here, this is the entanglement wedge of this right side. This is also the causal wedge of this right side. We throw in some matter that's negative, that's got negative energy in it. The entanglement wedge, the, the causal wedge is going to grow. And in fact, you can engineer a situation where now the entanglement wedge does not include the causal wedge. And that's a disaster. So we said, okay, something has to change. So the most natural thing to do is to say, let's define the surface that goes into this using this, the same way that we defined it before using the area. And this leads us to V4, which is the um, final version of the proposal. It's quantum extremal surfaces. So V4. So this is um, non-static, so it's time-dependent and to all orders, perturbatively. So the minimum entropy R is given by the generalized entropy of a quantum extremal surface, which I'll call chi R, where the functional derivative of the generalized entropy of chi R with respect to any, any normal to the surface is zero. So we're now taking a stationary point or extremum of the generalized entropy instead of the area. And the other conditions essentially remain the same. So this is, so this is what we call quantum extremal. So this, uh, this will include the entropy on the homology hypersurface. So chi r. So we're including the area or the generalized area of chi r <coughs> over 4g plus the Bonneman entropy of rho on hr. This is the state of the bulk quantum fields. Is we're now including both quantum fields. So I think I think I think of it as if I see things up to some horizon, and I also include fields in my. Uh, That's right. So not not horizon up to this extreme. Also, you can. So 
So the, the entanglement wedge is going to be defined as a domain of dependence of this, and that's going to include, the, the definition of this will include um, the state of the quantum fields in that, <coughs> in the entanglement wedge. And now, now we're going to start to be able to ask questions like, if I turn on an operator, because not the quantum fields, I turn on an operator, you know, I'm going to ask, I want to reconstruct it, then these are questions that we can now start to be able to ask. And yeah, so this is, so the, the surface is quantum extremal and the other conditions, uh, it's going to be homologous as well. And we're also going to require that um, it's the minimal S-gen surface, not minimal area, but minimal S-gen surface satisfying these conditions. So one, one big difference here, right, is to, to determine this geometrical XR, HR. Yeah. That's right. Outside, which have nothing to do with geometry. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So this is th this depends on the matter in, on the on the quantum fields and the matter in your space time. Yeah. And and you know when we proposed this in 2014, we didn't necessarily think that it was a formula that would be particularly tractable to compute. Um, and of course in 2019 we found we found that it was computable, uh, but that came as a bit of a surprise. And you argue that it's always finite. Uh, well, so. The, it's not always finite because it's going to be a divergence at the, due to the, um, the area term blowing up, but that's a divergence that's, that's, that's good. Um, that we want that divergence because that corresponds to the UV cutoff in the dual theory. Well, um, so you, you're asking, you're asking whether this is going to fluctuate. Is that the question? If, the X, the X, if XL changes because of if what? If XL changes, uh, so oh oh so, so okay, you're asking if the if you include quantum corrections, you go from class called the quantum. If the surface will move, it has to move. Yeah. It ha so it, yes, it has to move. Um, so for for a long time, we thought that this. The quantum extremal surface would be perturbatively close to the quantum extremal surface. We thought that there would be some plank lengths apart. Um, of course, this is this is a little bit misguided um, because if you look at this this quantity here, uh, if you look at sorry, if you look at just the generalized entropy, you divide it out a over four g plus s of the outside, then you say okay, this this quantity, you know, maybe the divergences in this are going to get absorbed by that, but still, this is this should dominate. So the, this surface should really be something that's uh, um, dominated by its classical component, should be close to a surface that just extremizes the area. But this is misguided because the thing that we care about for quantum extremal surfaces isn't this, but this derivative. And so if you can engineer a situation where the area of a 4G is changing at the same rate that S out is changing, then you can have a quantum extremal surface where there's no classical extremal surface, not even close or anywhere in the space time. Um, because if this term is very, the derivative of this gradient is very large, then there's not going to be a classical extremal surface there. If you can balance it out with the derivative of the entropy, then you're going to get a quantum extremal surface. And that's exactly what happens in the evaporating black hole. We'll, we'll go over that. So this is not a good thing. In that case, you get these islands. Yes. So in that picture, are not, that's when you quite a bit, some indication of what HR might look like. Yeah, so, so in, in, I mean, in the case of islands, it's just a matter of um, slightly redefining what you mean by a homology. Exactly. Yeah. How yeah. could you draw that? Um, so I'm, I am going to talk about the evaporating black hole, but I'd like to hold off until I introduce a few other things, because it's going to be a little, bit, a little bit easier for me to talk about it all at once, if you don't mind. Because in some sense, the, the, it's hard to draw these quantum pictures. Yes, it's hard to draw the quantum pictures. It's easier in two, di two dimensions where you know what the geometry is. Right. Yeah. But does it mean that uh, this HR could include these connected pieces with some generalization of the Yes, it, it, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm going to stick with the standard definition for now and then relax it the when we get to the evaporating. Yeah, so the, the definition of homologous. Homologous is the only thing that changes. So you could say this is V4A with this definition of homology, and then there's a V4B which slightly relaxes this definition of homology. Yeah. But in general, it's a general case. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Some of you guys know how is the need to relax. 
So, so the way that I like to think about it um, is essentially saying if you purify your CFT so that it's in a pure state, then um, you compute. You want to compute the quantum extremal surface, and it has to be homologous to some. To, okay, in evaporating, I'll just tell you an evaporating black hole. We compute the quantum extremal surface for the black hole, and that's homologous to the boundary in this very standard way. And then we say the CFT is purified, is in a pure state. CFT plus the bath is in a pure state. Therefore, the complement has to be the dual. And then, then you know, and you sort of don't care too much about the homology constraint there because there's this um, non-gravitational piece. So you have to modify the story if you're adding a non-gravitational piece like this, I, the, the, the radiation bath. And yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit more, uh, a bit more concretely when we get there. Yeah. I, I didn't quite like to ask about that, but let me just look, let's say, AH voucher, you fold this correction, you can reconstruct up to the horizon. I'm asking, let's say, you have quantum like, free scale on top of that. Does it change in the location of mm -hmm. how far we can reconstruct? That's right. So, a bit, but the, the problem is that um, if you're talking about a situation where the two surfaces are very close to one another, then it changes the location by a few plank lengths. So, good luck to you trying to squeeze an operator between those two surfaces. Um, that, that's it, it's not it's it's much more practical to be working in a situation where the gradients are large, so you can actually ask, like squeeze some kind of a semi-classical uh, localized operator between the surfaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so geometri geometrically in the picture, uh, chi r is only is different from x r, but only by uh, infinitesimal. Or no, not necessarily. No. Important. Yeah, it's important that it can be very very different from it. Like, be again, because. The gradient, we're interested in gradients, right? This tells us we're interested in derivatives. The derivative of this can be large and matched by the derivative of that, even in the semi classical regime. The quantities is different, but the derivatives, you know, they, those can be comparable. Okay. So, be so chi r is defined by this? By this uh, so, the chi r is defined by this. Yeah, that's the definition of a, a quantum extremal surface. So, it need not look like that picture. Um, it can look like this picture, yes. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have to. It can have like a weird, you know, floating piece over here. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. As usual, when I define, I give a new proposal, I talk about properties of it. So, a few properties of quantum extremal surfaces that are very valuable. Well, if you assume Bekenstein's uh, generalized second law, which is the statement that the generalized entropy, that this quantity is increasing on event horizons, or not decreasing, then you have causal wedge inclusion. So that's the first check we want, and the fact that it's satisfied is great. Um, what we don't have is complementary recovery. It is no longer the case. Chi r is not necessarily equal to chi r bar. So the way to see this, so this is r, this is r bar. Suppose that our quantum fields in the bulk are in a mixed state. So then we say, OK, this is, this is chi r. This is HR. If our quantum fields in the bulk are in, are in some mixed state, then S of rho HR is not equal to S of rho of the complement. And so that tells us that that means that we can have a different surface here where this is H of R bar, meaning H of R bar is not equal to H of R. And so we can have this region in between, also known as the island, um, where we can reconstruct from R up to here and from R bar up to there, and there's this piece over here that we, c that we are not getting. Now, we could say, how could that possibly happen? How could we not reconstruct part of the bulk? Well, if your bulk quantum fields are in a mixed state, 
then your dual CFT is also in a mixed state, meaning it's going to be purified by something. And you would then expect that that purifying system is what allows you to reconstruct this island. So that's the intuition. We can already see this at this level without any complications of black hole evaporation, that when we have mixed state, mixed state in the bulk, we're going to it usually incur some no man's land, is what we called it in that paper. Now, that also means that we can have a situation where this surface, which is as a chi r, this is chi r bar, that chi r is quantum extremal with respect to the quantum fields on this side, but not quantum extremal with respect to quantum fields on that side. So it's going to be r quantum extremal without being r bar quantum extremal. So that, that's I, you know, very different from the classical surfaces where you just bury the area and you don't care which side you evaluate the area on. Now it makes a big difference. Is it extreme with respect to these quantum fields or extreme with respect to those? So we, we're starting to get a lot of dependence on the bulk quantum fields about you know, which surface we have. Is it even a surface that goes into the recipe? Is it uh, one that's under consideration at all? So these are all complications that come up purely for quantum extreme surfaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Is the situation the opposite for the island that has negative area? No, we cannot get that. You can prove using uh, the generalized second law that quantum extremal surfaces are never going, you're not going to have a situation where the entanglement wedge of R invades the entanglement wedge of R bar. Even if you have different types of matter in the, in the two sides? So, yeah, so you're not, you're always going to have a situation where this, this grows. So it's actually, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a fascinating story. So what happens here, sh shouldn't you know, spend too long talking about it, but what happens is you can, com you can compute how, by how much does a, an R quantum extremal surface fail to be an R bar quantum extremal surface? And you can relate it essentially to, um, to, its, to where it is relative to the R bar quantum extremal surface. And essentially what you find is that this is related to um, by essentially how close this, this state is to what's called, to what's called a Markov state. And you can't be more Markov than a Markov state, which is the way it would take for this thing to sort of invade that wedge. So a very, very rough outline of why is it that we know that the, the gap is always sort of positive. All right. um, I guess one thing I said earlier is that it's possible for the von Neumann entropy, if you have a uh, situation like this, it's possible for the von Neumann entropy of R un R1 unit R2 to be order, sorry, this difference between this one, R1, R2 minus rho R1, R2. It's possible for this to be order one over G Newton, but for this wedge to be, for these two wedges to be disconnected as a consequence of the entropy of four quantum fields. This entity yeah. has a structure of mutual information to take uh, That's right, yeah. yeah. It's the mutual information. It's the classically, the mutual information is only order one over G whenever it's connected, but when you add quantum corrections, you can actually control them in a way that the space time geometry is still classical. The back correction is small, but the mutual information is, uh, is large even though the wedge is disconnected, just because of the entropy of the quantum fields. Okay, so now in the last few minutes, um, we have identified, oh yeah, question. Yeah, sorry, um, can you remind what is H bar? So yeah, th this, so this here is the homology hypersurface of R bar. Yeah. This is the complement of the homology surface of R. Classically, okay. there's no difference, but when we start talking about quantum effects, then we can have this island so that there is a difference. So H, the over bar HR includes the island. HR bar does not include the island. Okay. So classically, they are the same. That's right. So classically, this does not happen. But didn't we assume in the, the boundary is the pure state? Good, because there is, if, so in order to have a dual, a CFT with a dual bulk, and you're working at um, leading order in G Newton, then there's the only w you, you must your CFT must be in a pure state, in in the sense that the entire bulk is dual to it, and that's all there is. Once you start adding quantum corrections, you can have a situation where your bulk is in a mixed state, so you're allowed to have your CFT in a mixed state as well. So that's the, that's you could phrase the difference here as that. Uh, could you just repeat what you said about islands about the, the pure and mixed state of the CFT? Yeah. So, so yeah, so it's the same thing as with, about the island, exactly. You, you can't reconstruct this because the CFT is in a mixed state, and this is essentially what's telling you that here's some information that's missing, you traced out over something, 
and you need to, once you include the purifying system, you'll recover this piece. If we, if we just look at R or R bar, then, then of course this, the, the boundary system is in a mixed state, but since we're looking at both at the same time, well, it's the same. It, it's very similar. If you look at the union of R1 and R2, and or R and R bar in this situation, yes. your CFC is still in a mixed state. That's the statement, because the bulk is in a mixed state, and the bulk is dual to the CFD. So, given your including quantum corrections, this A there is really the volt entropy, right? The that's correct. Well, the, the dot entropy. Volt. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay, I have zero minutes left. Okay, well, I suppose next time we'll talk about reconstruction. Thank you. Is there any further questions?